Hey Ashita, what are you working on? Just tinkering with a personal expense tracker. Oh wow, that's nice. That's like the official starter site project for every developer, like a classic crud app, right? Exactly. Thursdays are for expense trackers, Friday for weather apps. I'm pretty sure all of us have built a few of those. For sure. And have you noticed that most of the full stack demos that we see online are basically classic CRUD apps? Exactly. But as we know, today real world systems are way more than just create, read, update and delete. You've got to connect these services, you have to handle scale and you have to solve actual messy problems. Exactly. So I was recently at an intense 48 hour long hackathon. The energy was amazing. The ideas were awesome. But what I could see that most of the hackathon prototypes over there could not really go beyond something like a prototyping stage to getting to, you know, production ready stage. Yeah. And that is what let's do today. Let us go beyond a classic CRUD app. Okay. Let us take it all the way there and let us build together a proper production grade app which has a real use case. All right, I am all in. Can't wait. Can't wait to get started. So let's get started. Hey everyone, I am Ashita and I am Varsha. And getting inspired with your recent experience, let's say we are at a hackathon and we'll be building an app where people can submit their project ideas and browse others. Oh, how does that sound? That's quite an amazing idea. We'll have real time interaction. We'll have front end, we'll have back end, and we can design it to scale. Awesome. Cool. So this is going to be a full stack cloud native app. Okay. Something that will also be resilient, scalable, and at the same time production ready. Wow. So what do you think uh, we should be using for front end then, Ashita? React. Okay. It is fast. It's easy to use. Most of us devs know it, and it's perfect for iterative builds. Which, which is exactly what you want in production. So let us now quickly look at the code. So uh, we have index.js, which is a part of the core application, and it is the app entry point. It renders React app to DOM with strict mode. We then have app.js, which is basically uh, the main component and has provider wrapper. Then for state management, we have ideascontext.js, which has global state with use reducer, API calls, local storage sync, and also has the search filter logic. And we are using a component driven architecture here. And we are having three components. One is the idea card, which is the individual idea display cards, which I'll delete functionality. The other is the idea form, which is basically the form that lets you add ideas and it has validation as well as category selection. And the third is the search and filter functionality. So this is basically the search input component which has real time filtering. So now let's see how we can get started and host it. So we'll first start with npm start. And we can add our ideas here. So you can even delete existing ideas. So let us add a new idea. Let us add a medical helper. What it does is that you give it its symptoms and it is going to tell if you have any issues. We'll be building it on React and it is going to have a lot of APIs. So as you can see, it is adding the idea. Wow, I love how seamless this is. Exactly. Notice closely, mm -hmm. this is still on local host. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. And let me show it to you how we can host it so that it can be accessed by all other people and not just both of us. Yeah. So we'll be using S3 for storage and we'll be serving it through CloudFront. This way, it will be catched globally so that no matter where your users are, they'll get fast load times. And this is actually one of the signs of a production grade app, speed and reliability at scale. But to do that, we will have to create a build. Perfect. 
So how we can do that is we'll be going back to our Visual Studio code and we'll be running npm run build. So this will create the production build. And as you can see here, the build folder is there and the build will get created. And you are going to upload this build on the S3 bucket? Exactly. Okay, so is the build ready? It's done and it's there on S3. Wow, amazing. Let me quickly get my laptop. Okay, so this is the S3 bucket and I can see that you have already uploaded the assets in this particular folder. So as we are using S3 and CloudFront both, three things are particularly happening. Number one is the performance because it's a global caching layer exactly. and uh, the CloudFront is going to access all the files from the S3 and in that way it is causing the faster load times that you mentioned. So performance is a, is a good win for us. We have also scalability because S3 is highly available, it's durable and there's no servers to manage. And the biggest of all is the security because the S3 bucket this time is, is private and only CloudFront can access the assets from the S3 bucket. The S3 bucket is where we have all the front-end files that Ashita has just generated, the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all of that. Secondly, I would also like to show the permissions over here. This bucket is not public as compared to like we do static website hosting where we have all the files in the S3 and then we host it, the bucket is public. So something like that we do not have. We are blocking the public access. It is a private bucket. So and this is really good because then you don't expose your storage directly. Yes, this is intentional. And in production, you would not want your content to be publicly accessible. Exactly. So CloudFront, so let me just show about the CloudFront and here we have the origin. So CloudFront is sitting in front of the S3 bucket and we have used origin access control for that wherein we have all the content in the S3 bucket and that is getting access control. The bucket, the bucket stays private and the app is also accessible. So this is where we have it. So as we can see here that the origin path is set to the assets folder where we have stored all our files and this is the origin access control settings. Here, I would want to say that when we said that the CloudFront is sitting in front of S3 and only via CloudFront we are going to access the files, which means there is a bucket policy as well, which I'm going to show over here. As we can see in this bucket policy that only we are allowing CloudFront to access to do a get object call. And we have specifically mentioned that this is the distribution that is going to access this particular files that we have in the S3 bucket. So yeah, I mean, again, the bucket stays private that way and it is safe and the while the app is also accessible. So with that, what I'm going to do is, I'll go back to the cloud front and I'm going to grab this domain name. And since we have the files and the index.html which you have just shown, I'm just going to hit index.html with that. Okay, so as we can see now that the app is transitioned from the local host to now it has been hosted globally accessible on CloudFront. Sure, so everyone can now use it. Yes, they can. Now, what happens next? Varsha, when someone submits their idea, it will hit an API gateway endpoint. It's going to trigger a Lambda function okay. and will store the data in DynamoDB. Hmm. Awesome. Then let us quickly look at the architecture for this then. Yeah. So here's the architecture diagram and why don't you walk us through this? Definitely. So this serverless architecture begins with users accessing our React application, which as you have seen is deployed to S3 and has been distributed globally via CloudFront. Now, when the users interact with the app, the app makes API requests to Amazon API Gateway, which is acting as the front door to our backend services. API Gateway then routes these requests to the appropriate Lambda functions, which execute the business logic. All of this happens without requiring any server management. Mm. And what Lambda then does actually is it communicates bi-directionally with DynamoDB. And DynamoDB is a NoSQL database, which is used to store and retrieve data as and when required. Okay, 
Yeah, I mean, DynamoDB being the NoSQL data, it is fast, it is scalable, and it is perfect for like unstructured data like we have these ideas, right? Exactly. And with that, I think this flow now gives us the decoupled architecture, which is like super important in production, where every service that we can see is scalable and independently maintainable. Kudos to that. Why not do a console walkthrough and, you know, just show everyone how we can do it? So as we have seen in the architecture diagram that the CloudFront and S3 is now integrated with each other. So now this is our Lambda console in which we can see that this is an event-driven architecture wherein we have an API gateway attached to the Lambda. So whenever the user is going to hit an HTTP request, it is going to go through the cloud front and it is going to land up at the API gateway. Now once that does, the Lambda is going to get invoked. So if I can quickly show the API gateway, here is the get ideas endpoint and we have integrated this with our Lambda. So if I click over here, it again takes us back to the Lambda. So this shows that the Lambda and the API gateway are now connected to each other. So with that, what we can do is let's go back to the app and now we'll try to submit an idea. Cool, so let's say I want to build a mental health chatbot. Wherein people can talk about their issues and seek help from therapists. So this is a hackathon idea which I'm thinking and let's say we are going to do it like for social impact. And we are going to use some AIML over here. That's it. So once I click on this, what is supposed to happen is my Lambda is going to get invoked and the data is also going to get stored in the DynamoDB. So let's do that. So Lambda is going to talk to DynamoDB. Yes. So once I am adding the idea over here, as we can see, let me also quickly go to the DynamoDB and show that the idea has actually been added. So here we have the table, the hackathon ideas table. I'm going to do a quick DynamoDB scan. And here we can see that this is our entry for the mental health chatbot, which has got saved via the Lambda function. That's awesome. One quick thing I would also like to show is in the Lambda function, we have something called the CloudWatch logs, which are integrated, which is going to show us that the Lambda function ran. So let me also quickly walk you through the Lambda functions, CloudWatch logs. So here we go. As we can see from the logs that this was my request and the idea has been submitted successfully. That's awesome. But you know what I was thinking? Mm -hmm. Why are we choosing Lambda over containers? Containers are great. They are suited for like long running services which would need specific configurations. But the trade-off with containers is that you still need to manage some sort of infrastructures like scaling, orchestration, especially like you might be aware if you're using Kubernetes. Exactly. But uh, for our hackathon app, I would say where the scaling is unpredictable and we would want to focus more on building the features that we want, like probably we can later scale it to likes and comments, then Lambda seems to be the perfect fit because with Lambda, you do not have to worry about servers at all and it can scale automatically from like zero to thousands of users per second. Uh, and then the traffic is going to be unpredictable. There's going to be hackathon rush. And more importantly, you know, we only pay for what we use, right? It's a pay per use model. So we don't have to keep idle servers running with the containers, which would happen in that case. And it just, yeah, it just lets us focus on the implementation on building that. So that is really good because it basically lets us focus only on building features yeah. instead of worrying about infra. And it is cost efficient that way. And that is a real world business consideration. Completely agreed. Okay, so I have another question. Okay, go ahead. You mentioned yeah. about DynamoDB. Mm -hmm. And as I know, DynamoDB is a NoSQL DB. Yes. So I wanted to understand the rationale behind choosing a NoSQL database over a MySQL database. 
Oh, great question. I think this is something which we always discuss when we are designing our database, right? The main reason I would say is flexibility and scalability. So no SQL, especially like we're using DynamoDB in this case, it is designed for applications with fast changing or unstructured data like the ideas that we are having. It's user generated contents or real time events, whatever the case may be. So it's good with the unstructured database, like I said, but with my SQL, we have a rigid schema and scaling right heavy workloads, which would definitely need to happen in case of hackathons where people are going to come into the rush and submit a lot of ideas. Scaling right heavy workloads will get a bit tricky over there. And with DynamoDB, the good thing is it scales like automatically handles massive traffic with low latency. That's something that we are looking for. And yeah, it's fully managed. Oh, wow. So you don't have to deal with provisioning and, you know, patching and scaling and all of those things. Like it's just production ready out of the box. So bottom line for our use case, we will have fast reads, yes. right? Yes. We will have flexible data which we do need and it is good for unpredictable traffic. That's true. So DynamoDB just fits better. Makes sense. Yep. So just to recap, we have got our front end hosted on S3 and CloudFront. The API is now powered by API Gateway and Lambda. We have our DynamoDB which is storing the data. Every part of this setup is serverless and scalable by design. What is That is something which we actually tried to that is something which we thought of building at the very first thing, right? Yeah. And while doing this, we are not just gluing things together. Yeah. We are thinking about performance, cost, resilience, and all these things are actually the pillars of a real world system. Yes, absolutely. But coming to that, every decision has a trade-off. So what are the trade-offs that we are thinking? Like what are we actually losing? Huh. when we are going for serverless. With serverless, I would say we lose a bit of the control, especially we have like custom run times and you know, low latency processing, but cold starts can be a thing too. So for most use cases, especially like we have this even driven once, when I'm going to add the app tomorrow morning, let's say if I'm going to fire up the app and add the idea, it is going to take a bit more time to add the idea and then come that and you know, seeing that on the console. So that is the cold start into play. However, uh, if I talk about the event-driven benefits, that kind of outweigh the complexity around that. So basically, we've built a cloud-native production-ready app in record time, but we are just getting started. Yes. So if you found this breakdown useful, we would love to hear what are the real-world apps you are building and what questions you have about serverless architectures. Absolutely. So don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and drop a comment below. If you want to see us dive deeper into any of these topics, whether it is more on Lambda, DynamoDB or scaling with serverless. We are all in to help you build and scale your ideas. Thanks for watching. Happy, Happy coding. coding.